So officially welcome, bienvenidos to today's workshop, A Beginner's Guide to Data Literacy, Practicing with Data Share. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or CORE Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And we're co-facilitating today's workshop with Eva Holt from DataShare Santa Cruz County and George Malakowski from the Santa Cruz County Human Services Department. And today's session, like other core events, is being held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who is providing interpretation today, and Gisela Carrasco, who translates comments and questions in the chat. And I will turn it over to Eva, who will tell us a little bit about DataShare. Thanks, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. I'm happy to be here. Um, so if you are less familiar with DataShare, this is an interactive platform with over 400 data indicators from local, state, and national sources. Um, we aim to have the updated version of all data and reports with the most current information on the site. And it's constantly changing with new indicators being added. Uh, our goal is to be the central hub of information that creates alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators and to integrate data sets um, that are, uh, were previously not available to the public, such as safety net clinic utilization data um, that you can find in the local progress pages. Um, we know that the site is used for many different uses um, for students, research, advocacy, program evaluation, grant writing, fundraising, etc. Um, and if you have any other questions, we'll get to them hopefully today. Thanks, Eva. And thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat, everyone. So we just wanted to go over some of the goals for today's training. So we wanna help everyone um, define what we mean by population health data that you can find on DataShare. And also just understand, as Eva said, some different ways to use these data, um, whether it's for advocacy, for policy work, for program planning and grant writing. Um, there's so many different ways to use what's on DataShare. So we just wanna encourage everyone to explore and feel more confident using the data that are here. So we will, um, try to help you identify some data that are most relevant to what you need to do, whether it's for any of those purposes, um, some, some things that might be less obvious about how to use some of the graphs and visualizations um, available through DataShare, and how just to navigate through the site. Because as, as Eva said, it can be a little overwhelming because there's so much here, but it is organized in different ways. And we hope to give you a little guided tour um, so that you can do more to apply the, uh, the data that are available and that are current in your work. So before we do all of that, we wanted to do a quick poll and see what your reactions are to some of these questions. So what's your reaction to the word data? How comfortable do you feel interpreting data? And how comfortable are you using data? So you should see a poll that you could respond to. Right, Nicole, I'm realizing that that poll is for um, the other it <laughs> is. Share workshop. Yes, okay. Let's do oh. this. We won't do this poll. We'll do an, an old school hands up poll. How many of you feel that you've already used data share, you have some, some familiarity with it. Okay. And is there anybody brand new to data share? Haven't, haven't explored at all yet. You're in the right place if that's the case, either way. Okay, great. So this is just um, perfect. We're trying to demystify some of the um, the various paths through data share. So you might be somebody who's played with it a little bit or a lot, 
or you might be new to it as some of you are. And either way, we're hoping that you'll get some valuable information today about how to, um, how to find what you need, because it's going to be a little different for everybody and for different purposes at different times. Okay, I think this goes back to you, Eva. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, so we just want to start off by giving a brief definition of what we re what we're referring to when we say population health data. Um, this data is used to measure health or quality of life, and health indicators may include measurements of illness or disease, as well as behaviors and actions related to health. So quality of life indicators include measurements related to economy, education, built environment, social environment, and transportation. And you can see an example of how this plays out on the slide. Um, and you can measure the health of a population by things like life expectancy, infant mortality, death rates, and those are all data points that we have on the site. Um, but population health issues also include major factors that impact the health of a group of people, and these can relate to the very structure of society and expand beyond medical practices or healthcare. So that could include things like income inequality, uh, political, economic, and social status, uh, gender, race, education, social capital and cohesion, as well as access to basic needs like food, clean water, shelter, and safe environment. So just um, keep this in your back pocket as a definition of the type of data that we're talking about today. Thanks, Eva. So now we're going to just give you a little bit of a description of how to get through um, some different pages on DataShare. So I'll, I will share my screen and navigate to uh, some of the stops on this tour and feel free to follow along if you'd like. So this is the data share landing page. And before we start our tour, we just wanted to say a few more words about why we think population health data are important. As Eva mentioned, we can track so many things this way. We can use data about an entire population to track the health outcomes that affect a group of individuals. They're often used to determine the overall health of a community, whether it's a zip code, a city, a county, or, or larger um, geographic areas. And as we mentioned earlier, often for uses like advocacy, policy work, program planning, Hospitals, for example, use population health data for community health needs assessments or CHNAs. These data are about population groups that may never become hospital patients, but their behaviors and outcomes are important to understand and respond to. For example, are there trends in diabetes or prediabetes in a community that a hospital might wanna be aware of and prepared for? Health departments, public health departments, also use population health data on a routine basis. And their counterpart to a community health needs assessment is a community health assessment or CHA. You may have heard that acronym or terminology. Santa Cruz County's Health Services Agency is in the process with its partners of updating their CHA this year. Um, they'll collect data from multiple sources to paint a portrait of health status and gaps and outcomes, kind of like the iceberg that Eva just showed you, to prepare for what's next and to develop partnerships with other organizations to improve health outcomes and address disparities in Santa Cruz County. Advocacy groups also can use population health data to propose or uh, monitor different policies like ordinances that restrict smoking in public places or make overdose reversal drugs like Narcan more accessible without a prescription. And also might use population health data to design and evaluate a specific program. So you might choose a baseline indicator that you're trying to change, like access to parks and recreation in a particular area, or the rate of uh, tenant evictions, something that lets you know whether you've made progress or not against a baseline. 
or you might be considering staffing and training needs to respond to some demographic changes like a growing population of seniors and how that might affect the portfolio of services that you offer or policy changes like whether a change in reimbursement for community health workers um, changes the, the way that those services can be offered and used. And so DataShare is a platform that you can think of as a digital library for these kinds of population health data. They come from lots of different sources um, and are compiled in one place to make it easier for you to find and use these different sources of data instead of trying to track them down one by one. And so um, one of the ways that you can do that is to look at the different resource pages. So here under data, you can see a variety of different ways that the data are sliced and diced on DataShare. And we're gonna look at um, indicators by location level. So again, you can go to data and you see all these different options. And now I'm just gonna choose indicators by location level. And I should also point out that in the upper right corner here, you can translate this entire page into Spanish, French, or German. Okay, so let's go to indicators by location level. So as we've mentioned, these hundreds and hundreds of indicators might seem overwhelming, especially at first, even if you know what you're looking for. But data, data share lets you search in multiple ways Sometimes it's helpful to start with a grouping or category of indicators. In core, we call these categories the core conditions for health and well being. And the population health data in DataShare are organized for those core conditions on the core results menu that has a set of community level impacts and indicators for each of the core conditions. But there are lots of different ways to get to the topics that might be of interest to you. So for example, on these indicators showing which ones are available by different kinds of locations, they're alphabetical within these categories. So this is showing all of the health, alcohol and drug use indicators. You can see there are a lot of them. And then if you wanted to look by core condition, the way I get there, and there are, there are multiple ways to get there, is to go to the local progress page. And it's the first item under local progress but there are other items here too, as you can see. Sorry, my computer's being a little sluggish. There we go. And on the core results menu page, if you scroll down, you can see that there are indicators for each of the core conditions and you can just click on them to get more detail on each of them. So you can follow along and, and navigate to those yourself if you'd like. And now I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Nicole and George. Great, thanks Nicole. And I'm gonna continue the tour where you left off. Um, so I'm gonna, Start off on the core results uh, menu page. I'm gonna scroll down. So again, you'll see the eight core conditions that Nicole just described. And um, each of these links that you see here represent community level impact statements in terms of what we hope to see in terms of health and well-being in each of these eight core conditions. And then if you click on any of these links, that leads you to more indicators related to that particular impact statement in that particular core condition. So I'm gonna show you an example and we're gonna, what we're gonna explain today is like how you read or how you make sense of the indicators once you find what you're looking for or once you stumble across one. And so the example we're going to use today is going to be from the healthy environments core condition and I'm gonna choose the safe, affordable, accessible transportation system impact statement. So 
So I'm going to click on that. And it does take a moment to load. And so you'll see that then it takes us to this page. You can see that we're under impact four. And then you'll see that there are a number of indicators, some that have data and data share, and some that you'll see uh, that say there's no data source available at this time, but we're working on it. Or we're working on seeing if we can fill that data gap. But we're gonna focus today on one that has some data. And you'll see that even some of these indicators are kind of grouped even further, like this one, uh, there's a set of indicators related to commuting to work. And we're gonna look at the one related to workers who walk to work. And you'll, so you'll see that right here, there's almost like a little uh, kind of dashboard that tells us what's available and what some of the trends are. But I'm gonna click on that specific indicator. And it takes us to this indicator page. So every indicator, every data point in data share uh, has a page like this. And so I'm just gonna walk you through like how to look for, or how to make sense of what you see on these pages. So it always has at the top here, the name of the indicator. If you wanted to actually search and go to a different indicator, you could click on that little um, arrow pointing down right there and then pick a different indicator. But we know that we're looking at the indicator workers who walk to work uh, right now. You'll see the location, and right now it's set to Santa Cruz County. But again, if you click on that little down arrow, you'll see that you can choose then different ways of looking at the data by geographic area. Okay, so we're going to keep it at county right now. Every indicator page will also tell you at the top here what the measurement period is. What, what range of time is this data from? So here we can see it's from the years 2017 to 2021. It also tells us if I hover over, hover, <laughs> it went away. It told us though that this is the most recent data. So sometimes there, there it is, it tells us most recent, but then you can see that there's also, if you wanted to look back at um, data from previous years or different periods, uh, you have that option. And then every indicator page also tells us again, you know, what this what we're actually looking at it defines the indicator so in this case it's the percentage of workers aged 16 years and over who get to work by walking and then it explains well why is this important so this one talks about the importance of incorporating exercise into a daily routine that has health benefits so every indicator page on data share has uh, those elements here and then if we keep scrolling down, you'll see this box here with the data. We can see what the current value is in our county. So right now it's 4.4% 4, 4 of workers aged 16 years and over get to work by walking. We can see here the source where this data comes from. It's collected through the American Community Survey, and that data is updated and, and aggregated every five years. Again, we see the measurement period who the data is maintained by, that means who's responsible for keeping this data, this indicator page updated. So here we can see it's Conduit Healthy Communities Institute, which is the organization that um, makes this whole data share platform available to different communities. Sometimes you'll see here under who it's maintained by, sometimes you'll see that it's data share Santa Cruz County, meaning it's our local team. Eva and uh, her colleague, Eric, that are actually the ones um, updating the data that we see here. We can see when the data was last updated on data share. So this tells us that it was last updated February, 2023. Um, so not, it wasn't that long ago that it was updated, but you can also see that sometimes the data itself, the measurement period might feel like, wow, that was a while ago, or there was a pretty, good size gap between when the end of the measurement period was, in this case, 2021, and when the data was last updated. So basically it's a two year gap there. That often happens depending on the data source. So it's helpful to look for things like, is this the most recent data? Uh, where is it coming from? When was it last updated? And sometimes 
we look at all of that and we just have to accept that this is the most recent data available. Uh, and then you just kind of understand that as part of your kind of context as you're looking at the data, explaining the data to other people as well, that the data might actually look different in real time today. We just don't have access to it. Other things to point out here, you can also see on every indicator page, these little icons. So uh, the first two here just tell us how our county's percentage compares to other counties in California, as well as the United States. So here we can see that Santa Cruz County, when it comes to workers who walk to work, that our value of 4.4% is in the best 50% of counties in both California and the United States. This just tells us more specifically that again, our county's value is better than California's, which is 2.4%. And across the country, uh, which is at 2.5% of workers who walk to work. And then overall, we can see that the trend, this says that the trend is increasing over time. Although it kind of looks like that the data is trending downward in the chart itself. So you'll also see um, in every indicator page that there are ways to different ways to look at the data. So here we have a uh, change over time marked off. So again, we can see for all those different measurement periods what the percentage was. And so we can see basically like the shape of the data. So like, when does it dip? When does it rise? Uh, when does it hold steady over time? This particular indicator has a couple technical notes that explain, um, and George will actually say more about this uh, in a moment, <clears throat> but sometimes you will see indicator pages like this that give you a little bit more explanation about how to make sense of the data and really some caveats or some kind of notes or warnings about, you know, take this with a grain of salt because there are some limitations uh, to the data itself. And then I think the last thing I'm going to point out, uh, a couple last things I'll point out is that there are, uh, for, a, for many of the indicator pages, you'll also see that there are different ways to view the data and charts by subgroup. Not all of them have the same options that you see here. So again, it will depend on the data source itself and how the data is collected. Here we see that well, we're currently looking at the data broken out by age group, but we can also select gender, and that'll show us any differences in workers who walk to work by gender, as well as race and ethnicity. So you can check off all of these and then it will display different charts. And then if you want to save any one of these images of these charts and use them maybe in a presentation or a report, you can look for that little kind of hamburger icon and you'll see these options to either download it as a JPEG image file or a PDF or a CSV file, which is basically like a uh, like an Excel sheet. Um, again, I'll let George explain the confidence levels. But so there are a lot of things that you can do once you get to the indicator page including, um, again, depending on the data point, sometimes you'll see that there are different ways, not only to select up here, what kind of regional level you're looking at or geographic level, but you can also select that down here. So if I wanted to look at this data by region in our county, I can select that tab here and I'll see that there's both a, a bar chart, and a, a map that appears where I can then see for specific geographic areas in our county, what the data looks like. So again, a lot to explore once you get into a, a data indicator page, but it has a wealth of information that can be really useful once you get there. And so I'm going to, at this point, stop my screen share and let George take over and tell us a little bit more about some of the nuances and, and kind of technical parts of the data. Thank you for that, Nicole. And we are gonna delve into some technical and uh, uh, data nerd type stuff. So hopefully everyone is ready and please feel free to uh, add questions in the chat and I'd be happy to um, respond. And so as 
Nicole mentioned, um, a lot of the data share indicators are based either on um, American Community Survey, which is a, a census survey that it goes out to members of, of all communities in the United States every year, um, as well as some other surveys um, like the California Health Information Survey, and there's also the, the California Healthy Kids Survey. And so in that data source, um, sometimes you'll see surveys. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about you know, what does it mean when we're looking at survey data and how do we interpret that and how do we actually use that for um, you know our our work purposes and for interpreting data and understanding what's going on in our community? And so I have right up here the demographics of Santa Cruz County and broken out by race uh, as an example of of how the American Community Survey does surveying and does estimates. And so um, you'll look and see you know the various groups and i'm going to focus on the black african-american and you can see in santa cruz county they're estimating about uh, 2800 uh, african-americans in our community and so what the american community survey will do is they survey about one and a half percent of all households in santa cruz each year and so if you're thinking well how many like black african-americans do they actually survey that's about 12 households in any given year are, are uh, surveyed by the uh, census to make these estimates. And so as you can imagine, if you're only surveying you know, 12 households, um, but you're saying that makes up 2,800 people, your, your survey estimates are gonna have a, a fair bit of uh, instability. Um, and that's um, in data share where you're gonna see the confidence intervals um, come up. And so generally what it means when you're surveying, you know, um, you have to see really big differences in order for it to be statistically significant. And so if you look uh, in their example of the work, workers who walk to work and you look at the breakdown by ethnicity, you'll see that many of the um, racial ethnic groups, there isn't a statistically significant difference. And that's partly because the census is only surveying a small amount of people, so the differences have to be really big in order for it to be statistically significant. And one of the nice things about um, data share when they have this data available, and it's not available for every indicator, but if you click on the little hamburger, um, you can tell it to show confidence intervals. And then this little black line here um, will tell you what the, um, confidence interval is. And so you can see for American Indians, and it's probably pretty small on your screen, that the, the um, estimate is 11, but the confidence interval is one and a half percent to 20.5%. And so I'm gonna speak a little bit um, about what the confidence interval actually is. And so really it describes how well a survey represents the population it refers to. And so in this case, what it means is that, you know, of this, um, this estimate of 11%, if you conducted the survey 100 times, 95 times the value that you got would be between 1.5% and 20.5%. And so it's a way of measuring the uncertainty of of your survey results. And it's, so it's why it's in, in data share, um, they're the color code and the significance for each individual group, it's comparing it to the overall county level of 4.4%. But um, what you can do when you show these confidence intervals, like if you're really focusing in on a particular subgroup, say the African-Americans, and you wanna say, well, are African-Americans walking to work more um, often than say uh, whites in Santa Cruz, you can take a look at this confidence interval and you see that it's not overlapping with African-Americans. Um, whereas with the American Indian, Alaskan Natives and the Asians, you see the confidence interval is overlapping. So there's no statistically significant um, difference in the estimates. And so that's how you really, if you really wanna dig in and understand some of these groups either by gender or race, ethnicity or age, you can really dig in and say, is there a statistically significant 
difference. And that's really um, important when you're thinking about how you want to use this data and for making either program decisions or grant application decisions. Um, because you can use this to say, yes, there is a difference and we may want to change our practices or try to um, uh, impact a particular subgroup. Okay, so I'm gonna um, go over a few, let me see, okay. Uh, a few other um, glossary terms just so that we're all on the, the same point. I'm not gonna, um, read all of these, you will get this um, PowerPoint and an email um, after the presentation. Um, but just, you know, some key key terms just in terms of like prevalence. So really that's often given as a rate and looks at, you know, how many um, numbers of cases are there within a population. So it's, it's usually gives you an idea of, a, of the um, distribution amongst the whole population so that you can compare um, different groups uh, prevalences. And then the only, only other thing that I think is worth uh, that I want to get into on this particular page is the age adjusted. And so one of those things, and you'll see this particularly if you're looking at the health indicators on data shares, this age adjusted. And what this really means is that they've taken um, a particular indicator and adjusted the prevalence by age groups. Um, and so it allows you to basically um, kind of look at um, prevalence across the ages in a more normalized way. Um, and we already went over confidence interval. So just so that you know, you'll be getting this, so that you kind of refer back to this if you kind of have questions or want to apply this to your work. Um, and the only other thing I'll just say is that uh, it's kind of a reminder, you know, sometimes data share will have averages, other times it will have medians. And just as a reminder, the, the difference between an average and the median is the median says that half of the population you're looking at is above your indicator and half are below, whereas an average um, gives you, you know, sums up all of the values across your group and then divides it by the total number of group. And so the medians is often really useful when you're looking at things like income um, and uh, different um, money type things, because then you can say, for example, if the median household income is say $90,000, half of your population is making more than $90,000 and half your population is making less. And that can be a little bit more uh, useful than an average where your higher er earners are going to um, increase the, the average wages. And so you don't really understand how much of your population um, is making more or less of that. Um, and then I think the other things um, we just wanted to mention in terms of uh, disaggregation, you know, is we're really trying to break down those groups to understand our community. And in data share, most of the time that disaggregation is by race, ethnicity, uh, gender, age. And then also we've really tried to um, build in uh, geographic distributions, um, which Nicole showed previously. And you can um, disaggregate a lot of these indicators by region, by um, census tract, and a couple other um, geographies, um, which is which is really useful, um, especially because a lot of our programs are uh, regionally specific, and it can be really useful to be able to look at it in those ways. Um, and so, as when I've used data share um, in my own work and with human services, is it really it's really helpful as a starting point to understand data and issues in the community. And so that's that's quite useful as a way of kind of creating a baseline for what's going on um, at the county level or at a regional level, and then applying it to specific issues um, with my department and in ours, we we do things like CalFresh, so hunger insecurity, uh, Medi-Cal, so health insurance, and then child and, and um, adult protective services. And so it's really useful to kind of look at the population we serve and understand what are some of the different issues going on. And then really to be able to disaggregate the data and look at uh, specific subpopulations and how those needs differ from, from others. What I will say is that 
you know, with all of this data, the way that it is most useful is to combine it with your practical understanding of the groups that you serve. So it is a starting point and it should be layered in with your own professional experience and the community experience um, that you seek in understanding and addressing issues in the community. Oops. Um, and I'll pause there. I don't think there were any questions in the chat. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Nicole Young for uh, an exercise. Um, thanks, George. We're gonna have an opportunity to practice looking at some of these and doing exactly what George described, layering in your own um, experiences and understanding of the circumstances around some of these, these data and statistics by doing a little scavenger hunt. So, oh, we do have a question. Thank you, Eva. Um, George, Brenda had a question about the confidence intervals, whether they're at 95%. Brenda, do you wanna add anything to that? Is it for a particular data point? Um, just when we were going over the data share, I was wondering when we add the confidence intervals, are they 95% or 90% or? All of the, the census is at 90% confidence intervals. And so okay. I think the example I, I said was 95%, but the, the, uh, all the census and what we were looking at, the workers who walked to work are all not 90%. 90%, thank you. And that's just a reminder again that, that the data on data share are from different sources. So they may all be, um, with some different confidence intervals or other different aspects. They might have different um, levels of detail in terms of, as we showed you before, whether you can look at them by zip code or race or ethnicity. And so if you're interested in a particular one, you can do a little deeper dive or look at a, a collection of them to get a, a portrait or a picture of the issue that you're interested in. And often it will guide you to what other indicators might be helpful for what you're looking at. So we're gonna practice doing that now. We're going to um, just ask you to spend about five minutes looking around. Um, so we have George actually put together a, a curated list that's a little shorter than all of the indicators. You're welcome to look at whatever you want, but in case this makes it a little more manageable and I'll share my screen and Gisela will put a link in the chat. Okay, so you should be seeing this curated list. And just, this is no big deal, but just hover over, you, you can scroll down and hover over one that you, or explore one that you're particularly interested in. There are, there are a bunch of them on here, you can see. And as you look at it, let us know if there's something that strikes you, is it, do you have some sort of aha moment? Like, I wonder why this dip or spike or whatever happened over this time frame, Or maybe there's something new that you didn't realize about that data point. This is absolutely not a quiz or a test of any kind. It's just an opportunity to look at these together. So we'll set a timer for five minutes. And then if you're willing to share what you discovered or found, we'll uh, have an opportunity to do that and to learn from each other. Any questions before we dive in? So just just uh, see what you can find out, what, what the source of the data is, what kind of um, time period it's looking at, and if there's some, some aha moment or insight or takeaway from whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay, ready? Here we go. Just let us know if you have any trouble finding your way there. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Linda, for sharing in the chat. see what everybody found on the scavenger hunt. Linda, could we start with you since you already shared some in the chat? Can you tell us a little bit about why you think that might have happened or what else you know about it? What context you have for that set of data points? Um, I, it just, well, I, I am, I work for the school district and um, in early education, that we're always trying to make correlations or, you know, like, sure. what do we do in early ed that will affect as they move, you know, through the grades? Um, I think part of it is that maybe during the time that it, um, it increased slightly was um, maybe because there was a little bit more economic and housing security and then um, after 2021, as we know now, it's almost impossible to find housing. And we also saw a huge dip in um, enrollment throughout the school district. And it makes me want to look further at like graduation rates. Um, and, you know, but starting, for me, it's always advocating why we need more early ed because then that indicates that, you know, usually nationally, if there's more early ed in, in communities, then it does um, show that children and students will go forth and graduate. 
Um, but we know that it's lacking, you know, as far as care in the community as a whole. So um, my surprise is when I look further into the regions or even the zip codes to see that there's a huge disparity in South County with high school graduates compared to even just like mid county. So um, it opens a lot of questions for me of why that might be. And, and it would be a great reason to advocate for um, for more early ed opportunities for, for children in, in, in the entire county, but Jaff County, of course. So yeah. That's, Thank that's you, Linda. That's just a great, um, great example of following the the path from one data point through some additional questions about why that might be connecting something that's at a later point in in education and age to the work earlier that you're most involved in and trying to look ahead and see how what you're doing now might affect students a few years from now so that was just a great uh, example so thanks for sharing that and um you're welcome I'm meant to offer that if you wanted to share your screen, um, my computer's being a little slow. I was trying to follow along with your example, but if any of you who would like to share your screen, that's available to you if you wanna illustrate what you what you uh, toured and um, what parts of it might be of interest to the group. And Linda also, um, I really appreciated your making that connection of the comparison to other parts of the county, you don't have to go very far to see some of these disparities. And that's one of the really great um, values of data share to help us pinpoint those not available for every indicator. So don't get too frustrated if you don't see it for the one you're particularly interested in, but there are more all the time. Um, and as Eva said, that there's um, constant change in uh, what we can offer through data share and trying to get more specific data on um, and more disaggregated data for these kinds of comparisons is part of what's um, really, really changed over the years with data share. And there'll be more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Does anybody else want to share their, their tour or scavenger hunt finds? We're, we're all learning here, so don't be shy. You might just encourage somebody else. Um, I can go ahead and talk about mine. Uh, I'm Johnny Shimon. Thank you, Johnny. That'd be great. And feel free to share your screen if you'd like. Um, I'd rather not do that part of it, okay. but I will share what I found. Okay. <laughs> That's <Fair>. okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, what did you pick? So I just scrolled down. I looked at the home renter spending to income ratios mm -hmm. and um, kind of the same results as far as like uh it's looking a little bit more bleak out in the South County. Um, they're at about 21% when the average um, for the whole county is at about 18.9. Um, also, uh, Black Hispanic in the whole county is at about 24 to 25%, um, and, at, whereas the overall is 18.9. So that's looks like that's how much, in, and I think that's what I'm trying to understand also is you know what is this um kind of giving me what what information is this giving me and it looks like it's telling me well this is how much of their income that they have to spend on rent um and so uh you know that 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 seemed kind of interesting to me and and i think the same as the prior individual um the south county is definitely um spends a lot more of their earned money to pay their rent. Um, and I'm sure they have other bills also, but, uh, you know, that, that makes it a little bit tougher for them. Uh, but yeah, definitely some good information on here. Um, uh, the time period was, it was, um, that one, this one was pretty recent. It was August, 2023. Um, and the measurement period was also the same. It was 2023. So this one was pretty close compared to the, the example you gave us. Um, and then the source uh, can do it. Healthy, healthy uh, communities institute, 
um, was the source there. Um, San Lorenzo Valley um, had very low numbers. So you can see the difference between San Lorenzo Valley, 12.6%, whereas South County, 21%, um, a big difference. So yeah, just some really good information. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Another okay. great example of how one piece of data that you started with led to some other questions and comparisons. Definitely. Um, so, and and if you, sometimes if you go looking for the data on your own, it's not always guaranteed to be the most current. So that's that's a really nice thing about data share when you mentioned that it's from August of 2023, you can, um, when you're on data share, you know that you're looking at the most recent available for that source, um, which can be handy if you're looking at lots of different ones. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, and um, I just wanted to also mention that um, when you're looking at each of these, I don't think that you can have a, ever a standalone data point. And um, DataShare does have kind of some thinking about that. So at the bottom of these pages, oh, and I just wanted to make a quick clarification was that the source is actually the Clarita's consumer spending dynamics. Anytime that you have a question about like, how, you know, what is the count of this or why is the analysis saying what it is saying? If it seems really off, you can go to the data source page um, um, and that the source is maintained by our platform vendor. Um, so just wanted to clarify on that. But at the bottom of each of these um, indicator pages, you'll have related content. So let's say you're trying to think about a renter community in comparison to community as a whole on um, spending on housing. Um, so you'll have those um, indicators down here. Um, it says community spending on housing. That's also a dynamics um, statistical analysis. And then the homeowner versus the renter. So just kind of to get a, um, you know, kind of a, um, a, a comparative look, comparative look on those. And you can, um, like George was mentioning, you know, this is just a jumping off point. So when you're looking at those other sources, it'll give you a list of, oh, other related data sources. So, um, you know, the kidsdata.org, et cetera. I think um, I know that that has been really helpful um, just to really dive into a particular subject. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully um, that is um, something that you also find um, helpful as you explore this. Thanks, Eva. And thanks, Johnny, for sharing that. Um, I hope that first foray will encourage you to, to do some more digging and, and keep at it because um, there's, as you can see, there's just so many different ways to find your way through here. And it, it really does reward repeated attempts and exposure. So that's that's really what we're trying to encourage today is to, to uh, let you know a little bit about what's available here and encourage you to try it. Does anybody else want to share their example in that spirit? Follow our other brave souls here. Well, even if you're not willing to share today, we hope that you feel encouraged to um, try looking at these in some detail and find lots more that's um, valuable and useful and relevant to you, no matter what you use these data for. And also that you'll share what you do uh, use data share for um, with us in the future. Maybe come back to a future core coffee chat or data share uh, data literacy session to show what you were able to do. Um, and Eva is available for questions. Um, if you have a particular um, need for something for your organization, or you just want some guidance, um, there, there is a great resource right here for you. So um, we hope that you'll feel comfortable reaching out as well. Um, we have a couple more things to wrap up with. But in, before we do that, any did anybody um, have an uh, a challenge or obstacle or 
some something that you want to share that we might be able to help with while we're all together? It's very likely somebody else experienced the same thing if you did. Or any other questions about what we've covered today? Okay, thanks for the chat comments. Ariana and Coco, appreciate that. Hold those thoughts because we have a couple, just a quick wrap up here. I'll turn it over to Nicole to take us out. Thank you. Do you mind showing your slides again, Nicole? I don't have them up. There, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a few more core institute events on the calendar. Um, next week, we have a core coffee chat where our guest uh, presenter will be Maria Cadenas from Ventures talking about how their organization has really embraced and um, is practicing transformational approaches to creating economic equity. And so it's uh, going to be, I think, a really interesting uh, coffee chat where we'll get to hear from Maria and the Ventures team about how they've had to or wanted to engage in rethinking their approach to programs that really, in a way that really centers equity and community voice. So for anyone that is interested in um, how you do that and how you do more than just kind of uh, make small improvements or changes to programs, uh, next week's coffee chat will be a great topic for, for that, for learning about that. Um, for any of you that work with other parents and community leaders that are interested in advocacy and really developing their own skills to do advocacy at both the state and local level, there is a Parent Power Summit being held on February 10th that is organized by the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network. Core Investments um, provides some support to them around planning and spreading the word. And so we um, get to call ourselves co-hosts or co-sponsors of that. So we are helping spread the word about it. It's on a Saturday, uh, February 10th in Salinas. Um, there are going to be some different workshops that are being planned and led by parent leaders in our tri-county region. So Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties. Uh, there will be a panel with some state legislators who will be there to hear not only kind of what some of the uh, topics are and issues of concern are among parent leaders, but also they'll share some of their policy priorities, um, particularly around child care is the uh, kind of focus for the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network this year. Um, and we don't yet have a live registration link yet, but we did want to mention that on February 27th, we're going to do another combined core and data share workshop. Um, it'll be less of going through data share and how to use it like we did today and more about what do you do with the data that you find? How do you really integrate community level data into your program planning, your grant writing? Um, how do you use that and really analyze some of the community level data to understand where there are some strengths and needs and gaps in our community? So we will get that registration link active um, within the coming week, but wanted just to put the word out there about these upcoming dates and all of the events, once we have live registration links, you can find them on the events page of the core website, which Gisela just put in the chat. And yes, I have a, a good reminder, there is childcare provided at the Parent Power Summit. It's a bilingual event, primarily a, a good portion of it, maybe even the majority of it will actually be conducted in Spanish uh, with simultaneous interpretation into English. And then last but not least, we do want to uh, get your feedback about today's session. We look at the all the uh, surveys and comments and it helps us think about how to continuously improve core events and these uh, specific workshops. So we've got the links in the chat or if you uh, have a phone and you wanna scan the QR code in your camera, it'll take you to the survey and you can choose which language you wanna answer it in. So that is it for today. We'll stay on for a couple more minutes in case anybody does have any burning questions or um, thoughts about data share and what kind of support or additional resources you might uh, be interested in to help you and others in your organization really um, learn to use it and use it frequently. But for those of you that have to move on to other 
meetings and other work, we just want to say thank you for being here today. And we hope to see you at a future event.